Rocky Town, it's a place where dreams are found. We fought so many battles here. Now we're the ones that they will fear. The cup resides within our town. We won't stop no letting down. The cup is ours for all to drink. It's our town, let's rock this ring. Yo, what is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town Rundown. You're here with us, your beautiful hosts, once again, Zach and Derek. Oh, my goodness, Derek. Sunday Scaries already. I'm hitting my microphone. What's going on, buddy? How's your weekend so far? The Prospect Tournament is done. Hockey is back. Oh, it was so nice to actually watch some sort of hockey that's relevant to what I want to talk about. We had the Red Wings play, technically, but they just played each other, but it was nice to see. I think that made my weekend a lot better. I did absolutely nothing yesterday but sleep, so it's been great today so far. I will agree with you, buddy. Today is a fantastic day for Red Wings all across the world, being able to finally watch some Red Wings hockey in action, right? You got a lot of the prospects. You got the current players on the Detroit Red Wings battling back and forth with each other. It was tremendous the whole entire weekend. I know the Hockey Town West boys were up there in Traverse City getting to get the bird's eye view on everything that was going on. They kept us up to speed. We won't take away too much of what they mentioned to us, but we do have a lot to cover today because a lot happened this week, Derek. And so before we jump into everything, let's take a second and say thank you to those that are coming on to this episode and viewing this, those that are brand new and those that are returning. If you are new and if you haven't already, why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you are new or returning, why don't you go ahead and just hit the thumbs up button if you are watching this on YouTube. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Why don't you go ahead and hit that follow button, rate us five stars. We really do appreciate it. Derek's really good with the animations on his hands, buddy. I got a follow suit with you and how you're doing. I mean, this. trust me, it's the exact opposite of what I think. So my brain's kind of twisted right now because I want to do this hand to point up there so it's getting hard it is <laughs> you're not wrong dude you're not wrong so yeah let's go ahead and jump into it buddy we got a lot today that we're going to cover we're going to start with red wings news obviously all the three rfas signed their deals we're going to go into the main topics and then we'll just briefly touch on the around the league news that is going around the league obviously so derek without further ado let's go ahead and jump right into it and start with the first person who signed, which was Jonathan Bergeron, who signs a one-year $825,000 deal with the Detroit Red Wings. Is this a shock to you based on how much he got? We know tr towards the trade deadline last season, David Pagnata came out saying there could be an opportunity in play for him to be traded. There's a little standstill on contract negotiations. So kind of looking back at that versus right now, is this kind of what we expected to see Jan Timbergren get? Are you surprised that he didn't get a little bit more? Uh, I'm, I think I was one of the people who was more so set on the fact that he might be traded. So I'm happy to see a deal was done. I feel like it's probably the right amount for him, especially with a little bit of a cap squeeze that we have right now, especially with the two other deals not being signed. I kind of figured if he was going to be signed, it might have been the leftovers from the main two deals you see right behind Zach. And what I'm getting out of this is the Red Wings, they still think that Johnny Burgers has something to show for us. And I feel like it's just that one-year prove it deal. Show us what you can do. You're probably going to be that third, second-line guy when time calls for it. So as long as he can produce on the offense where we need him to and his defensive game gets that little bit of tweak that, well, from what everyone's saying, he's been working really hard on that. He gained some weight. He gained some skills this summer. So hopefully this prove it deal ends up proving that we uh, made a good choice keeping him. Yeah, yeah. I think it, this should work out really nicely. There is still ample opportunity for him to be a trade candidate, right? I mean, it just takes one wrong thing or if he just doesn't fit exactly what the coaches require of him. Front office, right? Steve Eisenman. So there's a lot on the plate for Jonathan Bergeron to eat. And, and fill his void, right? So he's got to fill the void for the Red Wings much as he has to fill his own void. So he's got to come out, produce, showcase that he belongs in the NHL after two fantastic AHL seasons, technically, right? So the one before that he spent majority with the Red Wings and then last season, he's looked fantastic. So hopefully that can translate into the NHL, which I think it will. Expectations point-wise, Derek, for you with Jan and Tim Bergeron. I, uh, 
I know third line is sheltered a little bit more, but from what his production has been in the NHL so far and from what he's done in the AHL, I got to anticipate at least over a half point per game player is what I'm guessing the Red Wings are even looking for at this point. From, I believe, what is he at? Like, he was almost at a half point the se- uh, season prior to this. And then in his 12 games, he put up six points. So he's around a half a point right now. So point wise, just a little over half a point. And I feel like then he's become suitable. And then, you know, whatever comes up there, hopefully he just progresses. In that manner, if not, still a half point per game player in the NHL, still a good person to have on your team, especially on a third line person. 100%. And we did do a poll on Twitter. This was about five days ago. And the question posed was how many po- points will Jonathan Bergriff finish with in the 24-25 NHL season? 54% chose 30 to 40 points out of 103 votes. That was number one. And then number two, uh, came 22%, 40 to 50 points. So I think 30 to 40 points is more than doable for him. If he does not reach that for whatever reason, Derek, let's say he gets less. Is that something that Wings fans should be worried about? I mean, I really, it all depends on his game. Is his defensive game coming back and like replacing some of the points that he lost as he's working that 200 foot game, being able to run back, making those smart plays? If that ends up canceling out some of his goals, I think the Red Wings still think that's a win for them. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. It's not just coming down to point production, right? Like, how well can you back check? How well can you actually forecheck to your defensive game? What are you doing out there on the ice? Are you doing the little things correctly? So as long as he could do that, the production should come nonetheless. So we should be seeing him getting power play two minutes, or at least that's what we hope. I'm not sure if he's going to get the PK minutes, which is fine. But yeah, as long as he can get the power play two minutes, I think that we should see somewhat of a production within the 30 to 40 and even 40 to 50 point range, hopefully. And if there's an injury, like you mentioned, then he could fill in in a top six point spot. And I know, we know that Carlo wants to see Jonathan Bergeron play in that top line or maybe in the top six at some point this season. And we might see that opportunity. So, But going on to the next deal. Lucas Raymond signs his eight by eight point zero seven five million dollar deal with the Red Wings. Everyone should be excited for this. That was a fantastic contract. It's right around what we probably all expected. Um, I will say this: we did call out that Yannick and Bergren would be the first one signed out of these three, so it just made sense going that route, right? You try to get the lowest guy first, and then you try to figure out the rest. As soon as Lucas Raymond was signed. The focus really just went towards Moritz Sider, right? But Derek, with this contract, how do you feel about it? What are your takeaways from it? Is this a good deal for the Red Wings? But also, is it a good deal for Lucas Raymond? I mean, I feel like the Red Wings got away with a steal on this one. You've got a, almost a point-per-game player at 23, locking him up for the next eight years. And all we know is that Raymond is progressing step-by-step. So all we can picture is that he's going to do better next season and better the season after that. And if that's the case, oh, we got a $11, $12 million player for $8 million locked up for the next eight years. So that's a perfect scenario, especially if we're going to build around the team like we kind of need to a little bit. So I feel the deal for the Red Wings is really good. For Lucas Raymond, we're basically paying him for what he is right now. I'm not upset about that. I don't think that – uh <clears throat> team of agents are either for Lucas Raymond. He's getting what he deserves now. I feel like he's worth a little bit more. He probably took a little bit of a pay cut, especially with the deals coming up, especially with Fergie, Cider, everything going on with that. So I anticipated it being a little bit lower than what the end of the season probably would have told us what it came out to be. So all in all, I think it was a good deal especially for the Red Wings. Good deal for Cider. Or Cider. <laughs> Raymond, sorry. I'm thinking about the other one behind Zach. But in all, I think it's a good deal. We came out good on the Red Wings side. Raymond came good out on his side. Hopefully the next eight years are just tremendous. So, Yeah, with, with Lucas Raymond, I agree with everything that you said, Derek. I believe that this is a, a really good contract for the Red Wings. It's also a really good contract for Lucas Raymond. He gets the payout. Red Wings get him. I'm just going to say it. I think this is a cheap deal for the Detroit Red Wings. You look at some of the other players. I mean, even someone like, I believe it's 
Tim Stutzla. There's a couple players that actually make more than him that are under 23. Uh, I believe Owen Power is one of them too, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I, I just really think that based on his age, this should take him into age 30, maybe 31. You know, by that time, the $8 million deal is going to look like chump change based on the way that the cap's going to go up. And so after that deal was done, the Red Wings had just under, I think it was $8.75 million. And so a lot of people were concerned on, well, what's Moritz Sider going to get? But however, this is just pure cap manipulation by Steve Eisenman, the general manager of the Detroit Red Wings in a nutshell. He played it so well to where you were able to feed all of your RFA players, go out and get the UFA players that you wanted, like Vladimir Tarasenko, uh, Eric Gustafson on defense, and then Cam Talbot on goaltending, right? So Steve, I believe, did a really good job at not only facilitating what players wanted, but what the team needed as well. So overall, fantastic job with this contract. And basically what I just said, it's going to fit with Moritz Sider's contract too, which we'll be talking about after this one. And we did another poll five days ago, similar to Jonathan Bergeron, because those contracts were signed within the same hour, it seemed like, if I remember correctly. But the question was, how many points will Lucas Raymond finish within the 24-25 NHL season? And this one was really close, Derek. Out of 127 votes, 43% selected 80 to 90 points, and 42% selected 70 to 80 points. Derek, if you were to cast your vote, which category would you put Lucas Raymond in? Would he be closer to 70, 80, or 80 to 90? I did get some flack from some commenters saying, why isn't there a 90 to a 100 option? <laughs> I didn't want to be too unrealistic. Do I think it's possible? Sure. Anything is possible, right? Can he just have that one crazy wild season? Of course he could, right? I didn't put that in there, and I went with a 50 to 60, 60 to 70. There's more opportunity for him to get injured, I think, than there is probably for him to get anywhere from 90 to 100 points. But tell me I'm wrong. Leave, leave it down in the comment section. But Derek, yeah, would you put him in the 70 to 80 point category? or the 80 to 90 point category this upcoming season. Well, I'll just go out and say, I'll say this to make all those people who wanted the 90 plus happy. I'll go 80 plus this season. Cause after what he did last season, we show, he showed that he can produce and in a small amount of time too. what do you have? Like almost 30 points in the last 14 games. That doesn't show you that someone can actually produce in a full 82 and that's having a full, healthy roster. And that was basically without Dylan Larkin most of the time. So mm -hmm. showing what he's got out there, getting the new contract, being able to produce. And if he just keeps on progressing in his uh, status as a hockey player right now, he's 22 years old. He's not even in his prime yet. And he's already throwing up over 75 points a season. So I'm going to say 80 plus is excessively reasonable for uh, – this young man right behind you, Zach. So I am in that crowd for 80 plus right now. All right. And then last but not least, Maurit Sider signed seven year, $8.55 million deal with this deal. The Red Wings are now just under $200,000 in cap space. Derek, your initial reaction to this contract, is this a good deal for the Detroit Red Wings? And then also, is it a good deal for Maurit Sider? Oh, great deal for the Red Wings. We all know Maurice Sider's skill set, what he's used as as a player out there. He probably in the realm of, if we hadn't met the eight-year deal, what we all wanted, probably would have been over $9 million easily. But the fact that we got him at 8.5 or 7, oh, I'm still happy. And I'm even more happy to the fact that those two right behind you, Zach, their uh, contracts aren't coming up at the same time. So I feel like that's even better for us at this point. So with what we got for Cider at 8.5, it's basically a no-brainer that it's a great deal. Someone who's worth $9.5, $10 million, especially for his position, a number one right-handed D in the NHL, doing the toughest minutes. Great deal. Great job, Stevie. I'll take it all day long. Yeah, it was a fantastic deal. And I'm going to pull this up. I shouldn't have pulled it away, but I did not ask the same question. I feel like that it's not as relevant to ask how many points a defenseman is going to get as it would be for a forward. But one thing that I did do was I 
once Murat Sider's cap or deal was signed, Puckpedia was so quick to implement that on their website. So it allowed me to do some digging with Murat Sider's new seven by $8.5 million deal that currently puts him at the second highest paid U24 player in the NHL. He's the ninth highest paid right-handed D-man, 13th highest paid D-man, and the 44th highest paid player in the NHL. Nice. That's, that's really nice. Yeah, and the fact that the cap, Derek, we keep on saying this, every year should be going up anywhere from 3 to $4 million, right? By by year three of his deal, this this almost does nothing to the Detroit Red Wings cap space. Yes, it's still $8.5 million, right? But at the end of the day with the cap keep on going up and his skill set he's still going to improve and this even touches on lucas raymond you know these are cornerstone pieces they're so young that you're gonna have them by the time that they're slightly entering out of their prime if you even want to call that and it's so great because they haven't even entered into that prime because they're both under 24 years old right so the sky's the limit with these two moritz cider is the only player in the last decade or two i can't remember i know i said this last time the only nhl defenseman with 200 hits and 200 block shots in a season right so and lucas raymond yeah going back to him you know, just these two alone, it's then you you bring in some of the other players like we've already seen Dylan Larkin with these two players, Patrick Kane, uh, Vladimir Tarasenko, Alex Debrinkett, JT Comfort looks like that he should having a, a pretty good season. I think Andrew Kopp can have a really good back, backup season compared to last season. Uh, Eric Gustafson, he, he's had time with Patrick Kane and Alex Debrinkett. I think this team now being under their third season under Derek Lalone, the sky's the limit for all of these players, Lucas Raymond, Moritz Sider included. And so even the addition of Cam Talbot as well, I'll throw him in there too. But yeah, I, I overall, this is a steal for the Detroit Red Wings. I think that this is a great contract for Moritz Sider. It's still a lot of money. Could he have gotten more? Yeah, I believe so. You look at some of the names. The one player that is under 24 that makes more than him is Rasmus Dahlin, who makes $11 million a year. You're short by $2.5 million there. So <laughs> that's pretty freaking crazy. Um, and then some some names ahead of Moritz Sider, Adam Fox, Kale McCarr, Dougie Hamilton, Alex Petrangelo. Those players make more than him. Uh, Alex Petrangelo makes 8.8, .8, and then Dougie Hamilton is 9, and then the rest are obviously above 9. Right. So it, it's just immaculate. And it's going back to Steve Weisman. It's almost like cap manipulation. He's just able to make it to where you can fit everything that you want and need on this team. So uh, good for him. Good for us. Good for everyone. I think everyone won in all three of these contracts. Comparing training camp rosters to last season, here are some interesting changes for the Red Wings youngsters. Finney, Emmett Finney and Carter Mazur. Uh, are up 12 pounds. Simon Evanson is up 13 pounds. Supposedly, Danielson shrunk an inch, but is up three pounds. That might be wrong. Who knows? Maybe he was just had a hump back that day. Yeah, slouching, has in her neck or something. Who knows? Uh, Lombardi is supposedly three, po three pounds down. Um, that might be un inaccurate. I don't, I don't see that being possible. And then uh, the last Red Wings news is, is that Trey Augustine unanimously, unanimously, Jesus, selected to the all Big Ten preseason team. So congratulations to Trey Augustine, who could not make it to the camp because of the NCAA hockey. So, Derek, let's go ahead and jump into the main topics, which is right below there. And... That says prospect tournament. So I'm just going to change that real quick. Well, yeah, you guys saw it here for Zach had the Sunday scaries. So he officially finally changed the bottom of the screen there. It is now affiliated towards the Red Wings training camp. Sorry about that. Everyone that are viewing this on YouTube, y'all were probably super, super confused. Like this was last week's episode. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Well, Derek, let's go ahead and jump into the main topic of the training camp. Uh, they basically essentially just practiced for the first three days, and then they hopped into the red versus white game, which was today, Sunday, 922 at noon Eastern Standard Time. We are currently recording at 226 p.m., so fresh right after the game, right? So uh, just a little bit of notes here. 
uh, Carlo decided to put this in here, but this is great that he did because I was going to as well. Uh, I think this is important. I kind of touched on this. Gustafson with Kane and Alex DeBrincat on the power play rushes in camp. Per Max Boltman, Gustafson has teed up both Kane and DeBrincat for one-timer goals in live reps, plus a nice Kane to DeBrincat cross slot goal. Gustafson had 60 points, 17 goals, 43 assists with Kane and Alex DeBrincat during their stints with the Chicago Blackhawks. Derek, tell me that doesn't make you excited. Do you think that there is an opportunity for Gustafson to get anywhere close to that type of production that he had when he was playing with them or in Chicago in general? Do I believe that production is going to be the same as it was, was that four years ago now, five years ago? Not, not really. This, not the same, but do you think that he can get close to that if not match it? I would say the production should be close enough. If you had the suit, two of the same players that you pretty much led all these goals with and gave all these assists to on this point, you would feel like that chemistry is probably still there. And you should know how the other people are actually working in the lineup and how they actually produce in the game. So it's believable to say that it's possible that he might get up to this area again. Do I think with all of them aging a little bit more, minus to bring it? I feel like I would say 50 I would be happy with. If he got up to the 50-point range again, that'd be, i say, equivalent to what that 60-point was back in the day. So, But I do believe that with all those guys, they know the chemistry, they know each other, they know how each other plays still. And from what uh, Carlo has stated to us, it sounds like it's still pretty, pretty decent over in the practices. So hopefully that does translate to games for us. That would be pretty, pretty excited. Yeah, I think it comes down to, you know, how well can Gustafson adjust to Derek Lalone's system? I think now they have Patrick Kane coming into his second season and uh, his first full healthy offseason, mind you, as well. And Alex DeBrincat also getting into now his, I believe this is his, third, his second season with the Detroit Red Wings, almost at third. Feels like these players have been with us forever now at this point. But we're finally coming out of the darkness. We're finally seeing the light. So there's a lot to be excited about for me. I don't think that he can get the 60 points or more. If he can get close to the 40 point range, I think that's more than okay with me. Majority of his points more than likely are going to come from the power play. So he's going to be on the PP one, right? Cider more than likely probably on the PP two, right? So that production is probably, do you think that he is he going to get under or over 15 goals, Derek? Ooh, I'm going to go with under on that. I'm, I'll am i be surprised if he breaks double digits and goals. I definitely won't be surprised if he hits over 20 to 30 in assists, though. That's what I'm really hoping for. Hoping he becomes that playmaker that he was known for back in the day. Yeah, do we really need him to be scoring goals? No, because I'm going to name off all the players that I did earlier. Lucas Raymond, Dylan Larkin, Patrick Kane, Vladimir Tarasenko. You can even add in a Yonatan Berggren if you really wanted to. Uh, I think JT Comfort can score some goals too. So there, there's plenty of opportunity for other players to score goals. So I like how you put it. Let him kind of facilitate the puck and let other people rip it. I think that's more than fine. Would I hate it if he got double digit goals? No, not at all. Is it possible? I'm kind of right there with you, Derek. I think it's going to be under 15 and I don't think it's going to be double digit. I think it's probably going to be more close to seven, eight or nine. He's going to be right underneath it, which you're not going to be upset with him even getting that amount of goals. Goals for defense defensemen are tough to come by, right? Unless you're a freak like Kale McCarr or Quinn Hughes or, or one of those players, right? But yeah, I think there is a lot of opportunity here for us to see a lot of great action from those three players. I mean, there's a lot of players on this team that have formerly played with each other on previous teams. So there's a lot to be excited about going into this regular season, Derek. I'm a firm believer in that. And so, Derek, let's go ahead and jump into the red versus white game for the Detroit Red Wings. And real quick, I am just going to pull up the roster list. And just name off who was on what team. Team Red consisted of Olimata, Justin Hall, Ben Sherratt, Andrew Kopp, Lucas Raymond, Hunter Johannes, Michael Rasmussen, Michael Branzig-Nigard, Nate Danielson, 
Antti Tuomisto, Dominic Shine, William Wallander, Eric Gustafson, Alexander Dosette, Dylan Larkin, Cross Hannes, Isaac Ratcliffe, Alex Chason, Derek's all-time favorite player, the sin from the net power play merchant guy. Uh, I kind of wish that he would get a contract. I think he would be a perfect fit for the PP2, but as Carlos says it, that takes away from Berggren. <laughs> um, say literally his only job would be that, then sits on the bench the rest of the game. That's it. Serve the players minimum, water. Baby. Serve the players water. Go go out there and sit in front of the net and score some goals for us, Jason, please. And it also has Tori Dello, Patrick Kane, Marco Casper, Alex DeBrincat. Honestly, I really like that team setup. That that's pretty good, especially on the forward end defense. It could have used a little work, but um, maybe that was their game plan. They wanted the best forwards to go up against the best defense on the other team, right? But there was no cider. So um, over the team white, you had Vladimir Tarasenko, Tyler Mott, Sheldon Dries, Albert Johannes, Joe Snively, Austin Watson. Christian Fisher, JT Comfer, Carson Bantle, Carter Mazur, Jeff Petrie, Jonathan Berggren, Emil Vero, Brogan Rafferty, Emmett Finney, your dog, Emmett Finney, Derek, Simon Edvinson, Amadeus Lombardi, Jakob Rychowski, William Lagesson, Elmer Soderblom, Joe Valeno, and Josiah Didier. Derek, I know what I just said is completely false because team white completely dominated this whole entire game. I mean, at one point you were like, wow, this is pretty boring. And then the floodgates just opened right up. So I don't know if you want to touch on that real quick and just I kind mean, of I speak just, on what happened. <laughs> I don't want to resend that text backwards to me, as I said, because that's when Jill and dry scored that one goal on the power play time in the second period. And then it just, Back to back to back, like, what was it, four goals in the last eight minutes of the power play in the second period? I was like, Jesus Christ, guys, what just happened? I was getting bored with the one, two goal that they had in the first period with the Brigitte scoring 24 seconds in, and then Ammo, what, 15 minutes later, scored another one, and that was it. I was like, okay, we're seeing some good defense out here. I'm glad to see that. The one thing the Red Wings were pretty struggling on for a while there last season. But where is those goal production coming from? Like the one thing that we uh, had last season, but everyone said we lost. I was like, I really hope no one was right about that because Jesus this is looking scary. But then I had to send one text message and I, there you go. I got proven wrong really quickly. Yeah, if you guys were upset that it was a boring game at first, well, you're in luck. Derek is the magic conch. We haven't talked about that in quite some time. And he automatically changed it for the betterhood of everyone that was viewing that game so yeah going back to that game within the first period they played a straight 25 minute period right so they were just doing line changes regular five on five play the second period Derek you might have to help me out on this it was power play versus penalty kill action one minute stints and they rotated every 16 minutes I believe that's what it was correct me if I'm wrong and then going into the third period they did three on three action and then a 10 man shootout drill. So, uh, yeah, that's the way that the game was constructed overall. Within the first 24 seconds in the first period, Alex DeBrincat scores. So that's sick to see that the cat is getting right back into scoring form. No more shooting wide of the post or even hitting the post. Just pucks in the net. Just channel your inner. I don't want to say his name. Philip Zadina put the pucks in the net. God, it hurt me to say that, everyone. I apologize for the PTSD I just gave everyone. <laughs> Little back and forth between Hunter and Edvinson, so that was really cool to see. Honestly, glad to see that these players are getting fired up and everything, as they should be. It's all fun, all fun and games, right? You know, it's you want to be competitive. You want to showcase that you belong on the team, regardless that Edvinson's going to be with the Red Wings. Hunter Johannes, he's going to be with Grand Rapids, right? But nonetheless, you still want to show how dominant you are and whether that's scoring goals, making assists, or roughing it up with other teammates. You got to do what you got to do to showcase that you belong. Amadeus Lombardi scores for Team White 15 minutes into that 25-minute period, making it one-to-one. -one. 
And then Derek, I think you put this in here. It's the new Lou look. What does that even mean? Did you not hear them talking about him nonstop? Coming I miss clean I shave, miss... clean haircut, the Lou oh, and okay. look, buddy. Okay. No, I <laughs> that was the joke it. all day. I missed it. I was on the phone with someone. I had to um, mute the volume, so I missed that. But that is really funny. So yeah, I did see um, the video. Yeah, I think he he shaved his head and everything. Yeah, he just looks like quite a bit of a baby. Um, so. Well, Hopefully that uh, gives him more aerodynamics to uh, score more goals because he looks fantastic out there. I mean, I think between the prospect tournament and training camp, he was probably one of the better players out there. Um, spoiler alert. I know ho- I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Hockey Town West boys I believe it was Brandon who said this. He does think that ammo Amadeus Lombardi should have somewhat of a breakout season this year with Grand Rapids Griffins. Honestly, I'm really curious to see how he does in preseason games. I don't think that training camp training camp does a lot to showcase to the staff, like Derek Lalone, the coaching staff, the, the general manager, Steve Weiserman, um, and some other names that are key members in the general manager office or front office. Um, I don't think training camp is as prevalent as going to the preseason games and showcasing if you're ready for NHL experience or being on the team opening night or just getting a couple game stints. So I'm very curious to see how Amadeus Lombardi does in preseason games, because based on what we saw in training camp in the prospect tournament, Derek, I think there could be a really good chance that Amadeus Lombardi does something to put himself and basically kicked down the door saying, yeah, I want to make the team opening night. Is that something that you think could be realistic? I know we talk about Nate Danielson, Carter Mazur, Marco Casper. We talked about MBN based on what we've seen so far. It does not look like that's going to happen. So what are you thinking that Amadeus Lombardi's chances are to make the opening night roster real quick? I want to go realistically, most likely zero, but <laughs> From what he's showing over the last two weeks, he's proving that he deserves a spot at least on the AHL top line, and if not a look in the NHL right now, because he is producing, he is competing. His 200-foot game is fantastic. Like I'm pretty sure over the last two weeks, he has been the name that we have keep repeating who has been showing up the most over all the top name n- names that we've came up with already, as in Danielson, Mazer, we got HBN in there. like. The one person that keeps popping up is Lombardi. So from what I think, I still think it's a 0% chance, obviously, for the opening night roster and pushing the preseason and all that whatnot, even though if he does do well in the preseason. But most likely, I have to, if he does do this well and keeps this stint up, we probably will see him halfway through the season popping up quite a bit more. Yeah, uh, I don't really think that there is a good opportunity for him to make the team. I think it would come down to injuries, which it's going to happen, right? I mean, Derek Lalone even said we were very fortunate to have, even on the defensive side, I think he he might have said even the team as a whole, they really weren't injured that much compared to like other teams, right? I mean, Dylan Larkin was out, right? But you look at the defense, no one ever really got injured. So, yeah, I, I think it would have to come down to injury, but... Yeah, I think he's going to have a breakout season much than I'm following with what Brandon at Hockey Town West said. Yeah, I, I'm right there with him. I, I do believe that Amadeus Lombardi could just bust the door down in Grand Rapids uh, during the AHL season and just become an absolute lethal threat for the ops that he goes up against. So looking forward to him and seeing what he can accomplish. I mean, not bad for a late round pick, right? I think he was picked in the middle round. Derek, I don't know if you want to confirm that for me real quick. I think he was like a third or a fourth round pick. It might be later than that, but I'll give you time to figure that out. But in the meantime, filling the air, you then go into the second period. Like Derek said, it was a pretty boring first period. Going into the second, you're basically on the power play situation versus the PK. Sheldon Dries rips one down the slot to make it two to one team white. And the floodgates just opened from there, Derek. Did you exactly. get it? You were right. Yep. Fourth round, 113th overall for Lombardi. So not Shut bad. Dang. Off the top of the dome, too. Wow. Usually I'm wrong about that. So. Don't shoot the messenger, boys and girls, because I got it right. But let's go ahead and jump right in back into the game action, Derek, because Tyler Mott, shorthanded breakaway goal, 
makes it three to one team white. And that was a beauty of a goal by Tyler Mott. I was very surprised with it because the way that you, he basically stole the puck away, right? From a, I thought it was a bad pass. I can't remember who made the pass, but it was already basically not center ice, but he was middle of the ice going down. And he kind of like went a little left. He did a little curl. And I was like, where is he going? Like, does he not want, to like score this goal and he just puts it top cheese essentially Derek I mean your instant reaction from Tyler Mott and his goal I mean I realized why we got him in for the PK real quick after watching that the man oh, yeah. is fantastic out there literally gets the puck out whenever it touches the stick doesn't dance around with it can read the play very well is which is how he got that goal on the power play or the PK my bad like, literally poke check that stuff away right from that pass, read the pass. Like you said, probably wasn't the best uh, open ice pass right across. I'm pretty sure they're going from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he read it, he saw it, he curled out, poke checked it away, and got a breakaway right down the ice. The man is a great PK player, and I realize now that it was not a bad sign for the Red Wings to bring him in. I'm just going to throw this out there, too, because Carlo, Carlo threw this in the group chat. Over under two and a half goals, uh, shorthanded goals for Tyler Mott this season, Derek. And you guys can also play along with us. Go post down in the comment section if you made it this far in the episode, which we hope you have. Um, Derek, yeah, go ahead and let the fans, viewers, watchers, listeners know if you think it's over under two and a half shorthanded goals for Tyler Mott this season. You think it's over? I'm going over on this one. Wow. I'm, feeling, I'm feeling Carlo on this. Like I know his production isn't the craziest in the NHL, but at the same time, watching his PK, watching highlights of him on the PK, because that's most of where his highlights are. If you want to go look up Tyler Mott, it's pretty easy to see where he's at and what position he plays for most teams. I've, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling over three. I'm feeling three goals at least on the PK this year for him. I can see it coming. I mean, he already has one just in training camp alone. So, and that's with everyone barely even trying. So I like to see where this might go with him on that fourth line and what PK one, PK two, wherever he gets placed. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, this is a player I think it's going to be. I know a lot of people looked at him like, oh, he could potentially be taking a spot from a young player that can play. I think that this showcased a lot of fans why he deserves a spot on this roster opening night and moving forward as a fourth line permanent player with this team, right? There might be opportunities where come injury, he might be able to push up to the third line. Who knows? But we've talked about it before. The third and fourth line essentially is kind of interchangeable. I don't think it really matters, right? I mean, so, but Tyler Mott, sleeper guy, Tyler Mott is him. We, we sent that out in a tweet today, too. So uh, good looks on Tyler Mott for doing that. And then Simon Edvinson makes a four to one for Team White. Team White just completely obliterated Team Red today. Not sure exactly what happened here. But yeah, Simon Edvinson, he pretty much just kind of puts one. He he ripped the puck. I don't think it was a clapper. I think it was more of a, uh, I think it was just a wrist shot. shot. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a really good shot, though. Um, I think it was against Talbot. Talbot majority of the time was playing in that for team red. Um, so yeah, I don't think there was really anything Cam Talbot could have done about it. I think it was just a really good shot by Simon Evanson. So good looks on him for getting that. And then WMU alum Sheldon dries gets his second to make it five to one team white. And then Christian Fisher with a beauty to make it six to one in the third period, Derek, that goal, that, that was probably the greatest goal I've ever seen Christian Fisher score. <laughs> Granted, it's just in training camp, but holy hell, that was amazing. Would you Dude, agree? That was a you? ripper top shelf. I was like, where has that been? Like, I've never seen that man take a <laughs> shot like that. And he just rips one top titties. I was like, oh, okay, Fisher. I didn't even know that was you skating down the ice at that point. Okay, buddy. I want to see that a little bit more on the fourth line or third line, wherever you're playing. Hell, I don't care if it's on the second. That was beautiful. Fish. We love you, Fish. All right. Moving along. Then you go into the 10 team shootout. So basically, essentially, we'll just call it team white one, six to one. You then go into the shootout. Um, the only takeaway I have is that Kane is just a shootout maniac, bro. The way he broke down Kosa and Kosa even knew it. He was probably like, bro, there is no way I was saving that goal because Kane just did his magic. He went in really fast, 
slowed down. He essentially just went forehand, backhand, maybe like two or three times each side, and then just buried it top cheese. And I'm pretty sure wrapped around the whole entire net top shelf too. I mean, that guy, Derek, it, it, yeah, I, before we started recording, I was like, okay, Derek, we could go ahead and start recording. And you're like, well, you don't want to watch the shootout. And I didn't even respond. And Patrick Kane made me realize why I needed to watch it. And I commented and you're like, see, that's exactly why. So thank you. For- <laughs> exact words, I'm like, exactly. And I was like, we need to stay for at least two more minutes. It's going really <laughs> quick too. Like they're literally weren't pausing at all. It's like toss them that puck out. Next one, go toss the puck out, go. Kosa found out really quick what uh, top tier level uh, NHLers can do when they're by themselves skating straight at you. And he uh, re- probably realized he has a little bit of work on those one on ones to do in his uh, time now in AHL. But what can you do when you go against Pentrick Kane, the world's best shootout specialist? Like, let's be honest. Now, when you're in Derek, maybe you can you can answer this because you played some 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 good hockey in your time as a player as someone who I guess, do you think Kosa goes up to Patrick Kane at the end of this? And is like, Hey, how do I stop players like that coming in? Is what do you tell a goalie to do in those types of situations where you have someone, it doesn't have to be Patrick Kane, but when someone is coming at you like that, like what do you tell a goalie on how to stop something like that? Because I don't think there really is anything you could do. I mean, what I've learned, and this is coming from a forward who's never played goalie once in his life, you got to watch the body. You watch the center of the mass. The hips don't lie, as someone saying in a song that I can't remember who it was. Shakira, Shakira. Thank you. The hips don't lie, man. You can't move them like the stick does. You don't watch that puck. You watch where that body goes, and that's the best you can do. I mean, Patrick Kane's probably a whole different world in his own, though. He can move his body. He can move that stick. Like, if you even watch him, it doesn't matter because his stick might go one way, but the puck's probably going to go a different way. And if you're a goalie, you can't really do anything about that except get lucky. So you have very minimal chances of stopping stopping certain – I feel like Zach right now. I can't talk. It's Sunday. Sunday scaries. Oh, God. But, yeah, you have a very minimal chance of stopping certain shots, especially like that one Patrick Kane did. Like, that's going to go in on top-tier goalies. Like, Vavileski won't stop that. Freaking Ottinger won't stop that. McCarr. <laughs> Markstrom won't stop that. It's like, it's just there's certain goals that are going to be goals. Like, you can't do anything about it. I would be surprised if McCarr could save a goal like that. That would be insane. <laughs> could you I'm like, <laughs> go, yeah. I'm going to build through your contract, buddy. You're goalie now, too. Give him the Vesna right now. Give him the Vesna right now. <laughs> um, yeah, with that, like I said, Team Wade essentially won this game overall. Derek, the last thing that I want to ask before we move on to around the league news, because I think that can wrap up um what came with the training camp. But who was now who was your biggest takeaway player from this whole entire game? Let's say who do you think stood out the most to you? during this red versus white game, if you had to select one player? Oh, man, one player. I had two that I'm, like, strapped on right now, which is back and forth. One's a player, one's a goalie, so, you know. You could go ahead and name them both. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going – I'm sticking with the trend from last week. Lombardi, he showed up this weekend. Let me tell you, watching him produce out there, watching his skill set, I can't even argue the fact that he seemed to be the best player out there the entire time. Solid 200 foot player. I loved his skill set, loved his shooting, loved his energy. And then we had Kosa, my man. I still want his jersey. I think we're just going to get a Red Wing jersey with his name on it right now because it's going to happen here in the next year or two. So why not? The man is stood tall in net. His athletics is just out of this world watching him move back and forth that six foot six giant out there like jesus christ like no one was getting anything through until obviously the shootout which most people don't even like shootouts anyways nowadays so we'll just ignore that completely so (laughs) but their skill set the young guys that came to show up i feel like they were the ones that didn't really have the most to prove but they proved that they belong there so i really like that yeah, overall, I really like seeing a lot of the young 
young guys, the prospects, whatever you want to call them, they they came out and played, right? They wanted to showcase themselves that even though they primarily know that they're going to be in Grand Rapids, they still have a lot to showcase to the front office, general manager staff, even Coach Lalone and the Detroit Red Wings coaching staff because they're going to eventually work with them sometime in the near future, right? Regardless if it's even this season or going into next season, we should be seeing a lot of these players making the jump going into next season. It's going to be great. Yeah, Derek, honestly, I, I was only going to go with one player. That was going to be Kosa, but I'm just going to ride ride the wave with you, and I'm going to say Amadeus Lombardi as well. You know, I, you already spoke on Amadeus Lombardi, but for me, Kosa, yeah, I mean, everyone's kind of saying it on Twitter too. Kosa now compared to when we first drafted him in all the years that we saw him at the prospect tournaments, training camps, he is so much more composed, poised, confident, any of those keywords you can use to define Sebastian Kosa. I think he was probably the number one star of today's game, in my personal opinion. He essentially stopped everything minus the Kane goal and uh, who was it? Amadeus Lombardi, I believe it. Or no, was that Cat who scored on him? I think it was Debrinka who scored on him. Um, overall, I think Kosa was probably the number one star in this game. He showcased that, and it's going to be very exciting for when he gets his call up. Maybe he gets a call up this year. Who knows? I think the probability of that is very low but there's still an opportunity there and that would make Derek very happy but Grand Rapids fans take it while you can because Kosa should be ready here very very soon to make the jump to the Detroit Red Wings I mean Derek would you agree with me that this is a, a huge difference of a player than what he was just saying even three years ago I mean, even if you don't watch his videos, highlights, and any of his games that he plays in, just go look at his stats alone. It's crazy to see the improvement from each league. Starts off rough, does crazy good at the end. Starts off rough, gets comfortable, does crazy good at the end. I mean, now we're just about to see he's in the same league again this year, most likely. He's just probably going to be crazy good this year. So I'm just excited to see what happens when he gets bumped up to the next level. And are we about to see another top 10 goalie producing crazily on the Red Wings? And I'll be like, please, please. <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a goalie that can actually uh, stand in this head that we need to. So I'll be very happy once he's in the lineup, like you said, Zach. So don't worry. I'll have that jersey here soon. I'll ask <laughs> Travis. He knows a guy. Ask Travis. Yeah, ask him. He knows a guy. All right, Derek, I think we can wrap it up for the main topic on the training camp saga in the red versus white game. Overall, great effort, great weekend for the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, if you guys ended up going to Traverse City, go ahead and leave it down in the comments what you took away from this whole entire weekend worth of hockey from the Detroit Red Wings. I mean, there's a lot to be excited for. We can't say that enough, Derek. We, I think all of us, Carlo included, can agree that this is going to be a big year for the Detroit Wings. And, and I'm not saying Stanley Cup, right? But I'm just saying in general, there's a lot, a lot to be excited about, right? And if you're one of those people, let us know what you're excited about for this upcoming Detroit Red Wings season. And actually, why don't you go ahead and leave what you're most nervous about this season or what you are most afraid of this upcoming season, you know, because that's all relevant too, right? I mean, just let us know. Go ahead and leave it down in the comment section. Derek, let's go ahead and jump into the around the league news. And I'm just going to spit fire these unless you have something to comment on some of them. Feel free to just stop me real quick. Just cut me off. But starting off, Sidney Crosby signs two year, $8.75 million cap hit extension. Year one is only a base of $780,000 and a $9 million signing bonus. Good for him. And then year two is $1.09 million base and 6.53 signing bonus. And this includes a no move clause. Honestly, Congratulations to him. He, he got what he wanted, and I'm sure the team got what he wanted. Do you have anything to touch on on this real quick, Derek? I mean, the man's made $8.7 million for how many years now? It's He just loves the 87 number. Why don't you just give 8.7% like, of the stake in the entire Pittsburgh Penguins? But I should have just did that from the get-go. <laughs> they probably would have saved a little bit of money, and he would have been happy. Do but, you, you know, think? Yeah. 
Real quick, uh, do you think do you think Sidney Crosby like sticks around with that organization? Do you think he becomes a coach? Do you think he becomes a general manager? Do you think he becomes a part owner of the franchise at any point when he's done playing with his hockey career? Playing career, I should say. I believe, oh, 100% he's going to be involved with this organization probably for the rest of his life. Is he going to become an owner? No. Have you seen that owner stake in that? You know who owns that? The same people own the Red Sox and that one football team over in Europe, I think. No, it's some sort of football as as mine. It's, it's a massive conglomerate that owns multiple high-end sport teams. So, no, Jesus Christ, unless he becomes a billionaire here shortly, he is not going to get involved with that stuff. But I don't think he's going to leave this organization. He's going to be in high up. I, I can see assistant GM at some point, even GM hell. The man knows hockey. He knows what is good. He knows what the team needs half the time. They probably go to him basically for everything now. So I don't see why he would even leave. Like you're, he has a job set for the rest of his life at that place, basically. Yeah, much like the Red Wings do, right? I mean, Steve Eisenman was also always welcomed. You have Chris Draper. A lot of former Detroit Red Wings are within the organization, so the Pittsburgh Penguins definitely could follow suit with Sidney Crosby. Moving along, Rogers acquires 37.5% Maple Leaf Sports stake from BCE for $3.5 billion as part of Rogers buying BCE's 37.5% stake of MLSE TSN slash Bell Media has extended content rights to the Toronto Maple Leafs and Toronto Raptors for the next 20 years. The sale is pending approval from all leagues and expected to close around summer 2025. There was rumors that there that there was a team out there that was going to do something like this. And I guess I didn't expect it to be the Toronto Maple Leafs. If this is what I was thinking, that that this came out of the woodwork, like I think a month or two ago, I believe it was. I'm honestly quite shocked that it's uh, with an original 16, but I guess I'm also not surprised. Um, I know Carlo has a few harsh words with with that organization, which I. I guess I'll just say it, it does seem like that they're more in it for the money making than they are actually. Winning a Stanley Cup. To me, oh, no kidding. The Toronto Maple Leafs. Money, not a cup. That kind of sounds like their entire team, but I will leave it at that and not talk crap about another team right now. Season hasn't started yet. <laughs> Correct, Derek. All right, let's see here. Um, I kind of want to do these a little bit in order if I can. So, yeah, we'll go to this one. Boston general manager Don Sweeney said, uh, it says today, but I can't remember what day it was. Someday this week that he's disappointed not to have contract done with Jeremy Swayman, but is optimistic that they will find a landing spot by December 1st. That, that is primarily a good reason why, if you want to go back and view that episode, you definitely should. Our Eastern Conference standing predictions, that's why I had Boston going all the way down the fifth in the Atlantic, because I did not think that they were going to have the Jeremy Swayman deal done. Yes, they have a really good defense, but if they don't have Sway Dog and they don't have Olmark, I, and if he's not signed by, or let's say he is signed by December 1st, Derek, that's like 20 to 25 games that you missed out on. And if you and if you're only 500 percent winning, let's say they're like 12 and 12, that's going to be so tough for them to come back from, Derek. I mean, we've seen it with like teams like St. Louis Blues going from worst team in the whole entire NHL to making it to the playoffs. But that's going to be tough to bounce back from. I, I just don't see how they're going to do well, the season, I guess I'm just going to say it like that. You look like you got something to say. Oh, my mind was just going off of what Edmonton did last year. It's like, well, they were struggling all the entire beginning of the season, terrible goaltending. But the main difference between Boston and Edmonton is, uh, have you seen their top line? There's there's a little bit of difference there in point production and uh, who might be the two best players in the entire world on one line on one team. So I can see why Edmonton came back pretty strong. I don't see uh, Boston with their uh, old and aging core being able to do such a thing, <laughs> especially being at a 50% rate. Yeah, no, 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 no. They need to get this deal done quickly. Otherwise, someone's going to pay Swayman a hefty amount of money to come play for their team. Oh, yeah. 
All right, then moving along, Cap say TJ Oshie is expected to be on LTIR this season. He also joins Nicholas Backstrom and Evgeny Kuznetsov as key cogs from the 2018 Stanley Cup team that have been lost inside the last 12 months. I also add in here is this cap manipulation because they were like well over, I believe, $12 million in cap. It's it's really not. I mean, Oshi and, and Backstrom, their their injury history, it just it is what it is, right? I mean, they can't even freaking crawl to the net if they even wanted to at this point, I feel like. So um, and then the Kuznetsov thing, you know, it is what it is, but yeah. Um, all right, Derek. And then we got three new captains that we need to share here. Nick Felino was named 35th Blackhawks captain in franchise history. Oh, and then there's one final thing I forgot to mention. I'll leave that for last. Uh, and then 11th captain in franchise history for the Tampa Bay Lightning is Victor Hedman. Are you surprised by that one? Would you have rather gone with Nikita Kucherov or Braden Point? Or are you, did it make sense to go with Hedman? Oh, yeah. Hedman for days. Kucherov's just a little too full of himself, I feel like. He's got a pretty big head to be a captain of a team. Point, not a bad, he's a great player, but I don't see him having the leadership skills, so say. More so, like, I feel like he's the dry sidle McDavid as he was, like, the point to Stamkos type thing. Even though the roles are starting to reverse a little bit with Stamkos getting older, but Edmund as the main guy now there, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. Probably one of the biggest leaders in that entire locker room anyways. I'll agree with you, yeah. I think Edmund was deserving of that, that C. Now, when Victor Hedman is out of the Tampa Bay Lightning organization, whether if that's UFA or just not being with the team in general, not playing, I think Braden Point's probably in the next stop, right? He's still somewhat young, right? So giving it to Victor Hedman makes the most sense, not because of age, but I think what he brings, he's the number one defensive guy there. So it just makes all the more sense to do it that way. And then you have Ratko Gudis as the ninth captain in Ducks history. That one, I'm shocked but not shocked it's just a really young team i guess who else could it have been Trevor's that's what i thought too i was like it, they're so young like they have what he's the oldest guy on the team i'm pretty sure at this point <laughs> so it's like well we have to give it to somebody who has experience and not just a child who might make an ass of himself so <laughs> it, it makes the most sense logically at this point for them I agree. I agree. And then last but not least, the Columbus Blue Jackets share preliminary plans on how the team will honor Johnny and Matthew Goudreau this season. So there are uh, a number of days they're going to do something the preseason. They're going to do something, I think, their first game at home and then a couple more things throughout the season. Would not be shocked if they ended up hanging uh, Johnny's Johnny Goodrow's jersey number up in the rafters do you think that's something we could potentially see whether if that's with columbus or the calgary flames derek i could see it being a nice classy move with it's really it's always strange when they retire a number especially for something i mean this situation is probably one that not many people have to deal with so i feel it's like one in a million chances that it'll happen like this but i feel like it's a good thing to happen either in calgary where he had most his highest point production for those few seasons where he was just blowing out the doors or even in Columbus, where he obviously came down a little bit, but still a key player in that team that wasn't that good. So either yeah. one, I could see doing something like that for him. Just, just a nice little bit of class, a little bit of uh, saying we respect the family. This is what we want to do for you guys. Make sure you're remembered forever. Being the player that he was, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if both teams do it, that's great. If one team does it, great. Uh, I also probably would not be upset if neither team does it, but I think that would pay really good homage to the Goudreau family as a whole. Um, I don't think the league would make it to where no one wears the number 13 ever again. Um, but still, yeah, I think what, if one of the organizations can do that, I think that that would be such a class hacked move. And it's really not hurting anyone. It's just a number at the end of the day. Um, but it was Johnny Goodrow's number. So, uh, yeah, Derek, I think that's that's it. I think we can go before actually we go into our final thoughts. Zach Margolis, if you are watching this, I'm going to give you one more opportunity to claim and DM us to secure your Henrik Zetterberg 
bobblehead. If you do not, next episode, we will be selecting a new winner for this bobblehead. I want to give it away. It's taking up too much space in my place. I mean, look how big this is, and, and it's nice. Like, I, I like opening up things, and you guys aren't allowing me to open it. So, Zach Margolis, wherever you are, come collect this. Send me a DM. Send us a DM, whoever. I probably shouldn't have done this at the end of the episode. However, still going to put it out there. Derek, <laughs> I think we're good to go into our final thoughts, buddy. So, go ahead and uh, spill your guts. Oh, well, I'm going to get my samurai sword real quick and just open everything up for you. Oh, God, let's oh go Red Wings. Let's go Detroit Lions, boys. we got some games coming up here in about an hour, so hopefully we can not do a repeat of last week. That's all I'm asking for. But Red Wings are looking strong. It looks like we have some nice key components moving up the lines right now, so I'm excited for this season. I Beg that we don't have a bunch of injuries, but obviously if we do, that means we get to see a lot more of what the Red Wings deeper core has to offer for us. So I want to see what we can do. No one get hurt, but let's get the options out there to the guys so we can see them produce for us. So let's go Red Wings. Good training camp. Good red, white game, boys. Good job to the young guys out there. That's the big thing. The young guys really showed up this weekend. Good job. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Derek. I mean, let's go Red Wings. Let's go Lions. They play the Arizona Cardinals at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time or 4.25. You guys know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, let's let's go them. Let's go Grand Rapids Griffins. Yeah, the young guys, I think they put a lot of pressure on the uh, old ballsy guys, you know, making them have to work a little bit harder. But much like Derek said, you know, those players, um, they didn't. they don't have to really try as hard, right? I mean, that's not to say that they – don't have to work hard, but they're pretty secured with their spots. But nonetheless, no, good luck to all those young guys. They have a lot to prove. They have a lot to showcase, especially as you get older. You want to showcase what new skills you've, you've learned in the offseason. What have you improved on? What haven't you improved on? And what can you improve on as the season progresses? Because we are officially in NHL season right now, uh, whether if you want to believe it or not, preseason games, Start this week, the Red Wings begin their first preseason game. I think it's against the Chicago Blackhawks this upcoming Friday. And Derek, why don't we just go ahead and announce it? We will be at the preseason game against the Pittsburgh Penguins on the 28th. That game is at 7 p.m. So if you guys are going, let us know. We'd love to meet you all there. Maybe have a soft baked pretzel or something. Uh, no drinking and driving, obviously. So. I would say a beer, but let's not do that. But yeah, if you're going to that game, let us know. We'd love to sit down and meet and talk with y'all and just discuss Red Wings hockey or just NHL hockey in general or just hockey. But yeah, let's go Red Wings. Let's go Grand Rapids Griffins. Let's go Lions. And thanks for stopping by. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button. Rate us five stars. Hit that follow button. And we'll see y'all on the next one. See ya. Bye, y'all.